Hello, my name's James and I'm going to be talking about NIV, non-invasive ventilation. I'm going to talk about the principles and management. I'm a consultant in critical care medicine. I also am a consultant in respiratory medicine and I have experience of NIV in both ward and critical care settings. I also happen to have an interest in home ventilation and sleep medicine and an interest in education. Previous knowledge that you might already have that you can feed into this session includes the care and management of patients requiring mechanical ventilation, the indications for that as well as the contraindications. You may also be aware of the modes of ventilation which are used in the clinical area be they spontaneous modes, pressure controlled ventilation, volume and time cycling, and methods of humidification. So the aim of this session is to gain knowledge in the key principles of NIV and of how to manage patients receiving this therapy while considering the physiological and psychological effects. The learning outcomes are that we're going to look at the indications for NIV. We're going to talk about the benefits of NIV over invasive ventilation. And we're going to talk about how to manage the patient on NIV. We're going to look at indications for adjusting therapy in response to the patient's condition. And we're going to talk about the physiological effects on the patient as well as the psychological effects. The structure that I'm suggesting for this talk is that I'm going to look at the question, what is NIV? There's then going to be a short reminder of respiratory failure. What does that mean? We're going to look at practically how NIV works and we're going to talk about types of NIV. In a future talk, I'm going to look at the indications for NIV as well as talking about NIV failure and how we manage that. Okay, so first of all, what is NIV? Well, if we break that down, uh, ventilated suggests that we're providing artificial ventilation provided by a mechanical ventilator. If that's invasive, then we imagine that the machine is connected to an endotracheal tube or via a tracheostomy. If it's non-invasive, then that implies that positive pressure is being provided by a mask. I say a mask, you'll be most familiar with NIV being delivered by a mask, but it's not the only way. Uh, there ex exist still variations on the cuirass. The chap in the bottom left is wearing a pneumo belt and there exists a rocking bed that also aims to deliver non-invasive ventilation. In all cases, you'll notice that ventilation is associated with perfect skin and an enormous sense of well-being. some more definitions for you and I warn you that this is where things can get complicated because there are various trademarks flying around and different manufacturers will use a different term to describe what are essentially the same forms of ventilation. BiPAP or bi-level positive airway pressure is a form of pressure support where the patient breathes spontaneously and the ventilator provides support in pressure. NIPPV means non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, colon pressure control. Here the ventilator controls the rate and the pattern of breathing. CPAP, well CPAP improves oxygenation and helps to keep the upper airway patent. It's not truly a form of ventilation. I said that I was going to give a brief reminder about respiratory failure. 
So recall that respiratory failure can be divided into type 1 and type 2 respiratory failure. Looking first at type 2 respiratory failure, in this instance you are not getting enough air to gas exchange in parts of the lungs. The carbon dioxide is not effectively removed and the PaCO2, the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the blood, rises. The partial pressure of oxygen will be low unless you're given supplemental oxygen, but the main issue is one of failure of ventilation. What causes type 2 respiratory failure? Well, the, the work asked of the respiratory muscles may be too great for them to sustain, e.g. someone with a deformed stiff rib cage. The respiratory muscles may be weak, thinking about conditions like muscular dystrophy. Or the central respiratory drive may be impaired, i.e. diseases of the central nervous system and in some sleep disorders. I'm a simple soul, so I like a simple analogy. Think about a man who's carrying a box. Feels simple enough, doesn't it? What is going to make him fail in that task? Well, firstly, it could be that the box is simply too heavy for him. Secondly, it may be that he lacks the muscle strength. He's simply not strong enough to carry the box. Thirdly, it may be that he simply lacks the enthusiasm or the will for the task. He doesn't have enough drive to carry the box. Compare that to COPD. In COPD, lots of ventilation is wasted in parts of the lung that don't exchange gas well. We call those dead space. So the work of breathing is high. Because the chest is working from such a high volume, the inspiratory muscles don't work well. They are not strong enough for the task. Furthermore, many COPD patients have a poor respiratory drive. This is a slide looking at the pathophysiology of type 2 respiratory failure. Clearly there's quite a lot going on here, but perhaps focus on the three main factors of increased work of breathing, of respiratory muscle fatigue and of hyperinflation. Look at the consequences of each one of those. Now let's think a little bit about type 1 respiratory failure. In type 1 respiratory failure, there is plenty of air getting into the lungs, but they are not effective at getting the oxygen from the air across into the bloodstream. The partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs is therefore low. It's much easier to wash carbon dioxide out than it is to get oxygen in. So in type 1 respiratory failure, partial pressure of CO2 is usually normal or perhaps even low if the patient is hyperventilating. Fundamentally in type 1 respiratory failure there is a VQ mismatch. There is a difference between the amount of gas exchange taking place and the blood supply to that area. Remember Shunt refers to areas of lung that are perfused but not ventilated. Contrast that with dead space, which refers to areas that are ventilated but not perfused. Let's look at another slightly complicated diagram. This shows the pathophysiology of type 1 respiratory failure. Look at the key role of hypoventilation in whatever form that looks like. So now let's talk about modes of ventilation. And I'm afraid there's quite a lot of tedious terminology here. BPAP is bi-level positive airway pressure. It's essentially the CPAP ASB of non-invasive ventilation. BiPAP, little i, registered trademark, is bi-level positive airway pressure in the context of a Philips Respironics device. Usually we use this in ST mode, I'll talk a bit about that later. 
BiPAP, registered trademark, this time with a big I, refers to a Draeger device and it usually means invasive ventilation. In general, BiPAP means pressure support ventilation. NIPPV means pressure control ventilation. In pressure support ventilation, we set the level of pressure that the ventilator delivers with each breath. The timing is completely determined by the patient. They trigger the beginning and end of each breath and they maintain their own rhythm. It's well tolerated. The patient uh, does what they like and the ventilator will follow any changes in the IE ratio. This is a, a pictorial example of a patient receiving pressure support. See that the patient is choosing their own respiratory rate and their own IE ratio. Compare that with continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP. In CPAP, the machine provides a constant positive pressure, regardless of how the patient breathes. In this example, we're looking at a patient breathing on BiPAP. In BiPAP, the patient is supported during inspiration using a pressure support, IPAP, inspiratory positive airway pressure. The patient continues to determine their own respiratory pattern. They then exhale to an expiratory positive pressure of EPAP, expiratory positive airway pressure. There are various advantages of adding EPAP. Some are physiological advantages. It does also allow for a very simple circuit. Bi-level pressure control allows the patient to decide when they start each breath. But it has a respiratory rate to ensure that a minimum number of efficient breaths are taken. Bi-level pressure control is moving towards control in breathing rather than just supporting it. NIPPV, non-invasive intermittent positive pressure ventilation, is the most common pressure control mode. It's the mode that's used by many patients on long-term ventilation at home. It's also sometimes needed for acute respiratory failure when BiPAP fails. It's good for patients who have ventilatory pump problems, be it drive or muscle or chest wall problems. I'm sorry to keep reiterating it, but it really is important. BiPAP supports ventilation. NIPPV delivers ventilation. As I say, NIPPV is a pressure targeted mode the ventilator is set to deliver the same pressure with each breath. An exhalation valve in the circuit opens at the end of inspiration, so the pressure during expiration falls to zero. The duration of inspiration is set. The respiratory rate is set. Now this is not just a backup rate. The patient will be ventilated at this rate most of the time. Patients can trigger a breath, although they usually don't. If they do, it will be the same duration as an untriggered breath. So this is what it looks like when a patient is breathing on NIPPV. If we look at the different ways of determining the onset of ventilation, there are a number of different modes available. A spontaneous mode, often abbreviated to S, here the patient controls the beginning and ends of inspiration. The spontaneous timed, brackets ST, mode is probably the most commonly used mode on the Philips Respironic device. This is as above, but with a backup rate that only kicks in in emergencies, essentially when the patient becomes apneic. The assist mode, A, here the patient controls the onset of inspiration, but the inspiratory length is set. Assist control mode, AC, this operates as the assist mode, but there's also a set respiratory rate. The control mode, abbreviated to C, 
is a preset automatic cycle which we rarely use. What does EPAP do? Well, the expiratory positive airway pressure helps with alveolar recruitment. It helps to improve oxygenation and it decreases the work of breathing. It also offsets uh, intrinsic or auto peep and it helps to decrease both after and preload. IPAP increases alveolar ventilation. Recall that alveolar ventilation is equal to respiratory rate multiplied by tidal volume. It therefore reduces CO2. When we look at the physiological benefits of non-invasive ventilation, we are essentially looking at benefits over spontaneous ventilation. Firstly, NIV helps to unload the respiratory muscles during the inspiratory cycle. Hyperinflation of the chest leads to shortening of the respiratory muscles, putting them at a, at a disadvantage. This decreases the compliance of the respiratory system. NIPPV augments the respiratory effort, it increases the tidal volume, it decreases the respiratory rate. NIV also helps to overcome intrinsic PEEP. Intrinsic PEEP leads to a difficulty in generating an adequate pressure gradient for flow. NIV also stents open the lower airways during the expiratory cycle and stents the upper airways too. Because the work of breathing is reduced, it reduces CO2 production. It improves gas exchange by decreasing atelectasis. There are also reduced negative interthoracic pressure swings. Pulmonary edema is redistributed and cardiac output is increased by decreasing the effective LV afterload. The benefits from a patient's view are essentially benefits over being intubated. Firstly, there's the non-invasiveness bit. The patient is flexible in initiating and removing the mechanical ventilation. Uh, it can be applied intermittently. Patients can take it off for a drink. It improves patient comfort. It certainly reduces the need for sedation over intubation and it allows the mouth to stay available for uh, oral hygiene. NIV preserves speech, swallowing and expectoration. It may reduce the need for a nasogastric tube with its associated complications. It avoids the, re the res uh, resistive work that's imposed by an endotracheal tube. It avoids the complications of endotracheal intubation, be they early, such as local trauma, aspiration, or late, such as injury to the hypopharynx, larynx and trachea, and nososomial infections. It reduces infectious complications associated with intubation, ventilator-associated pneumonia, sinusitis, potential sepsis, and it's cost-effective. So that's the end of this first talk. Uh, if it's raised questions or there's bits that you don't understand, I'm, I'm absolutely sure you won't be alone. So please just find me. Uh, um, I'm often around. Or if, uh, if you prefer, just email me at james.boninton at nuh.nhs.uk.